A former senior Tory defects to Reform UK, a royal apology over a photograph, and is going to university worth the money? This is Politics Live. Joining me, Conservative MP Danny Kruger, Labour MP Dame Siobhan McDonough, author and journalist Grace Blakely and the comedian Jeff Norcott. On the programme. Please welcome Mr Lee Anderson. The former Deputy Chairman of the Conservative Party joins Reform UK. What does that mean for Rishi Sunak's leadership? We are slowly giving our country away. We are giving away our way of life. And like millions of people up and down the country, all I want is my country back. The Princess of Wales apologises for any confusion and for experimenting with editing after a row about this photo. I want taxes on working people to be lower, but look, the thing that got me into politics in the first place was education and schools. The Shadow Chancellor says a Labour government would make a difference to the economy and public services. Is she right? My mum, in the main, said go to university because it will be the best time you've ever had in your life. There was no consideration for the fact that some people just don't learn like that. With tuition fees at over £9,000 a year, is going to university still worth it? Let's start with the story that broke in the last hour or so. Uh, this headline, ex-Tory MP Lee Anderson defects to reform. Um, this is the news that the former deputy chairman of the Conservative Party has joined up with Reform UK. There's been speculation about it for quite some time, ever since he was suspended by the Conservative Party for comments he made about the Labour mayor, Sadiq Khan. Anyway, it became official. Uh, today, Lee Anderson took to the stage at a press conference uh, by Reform UK. Let's have a listen to part of what he said. They're not controversial. There are opinions which is shared by millions of people up and down the country. It's not controversial to be concerned about illegal immigration. It's not controversial to be concerned about legal migration. It's not controversial to be, you know, worried, concerned about the Metropolitan Police and a failing London Mayor and the hate marchers, the street crime and the shoplifters literally getting away with ruining businesses on a daily basis. It's not controversial to fight back in a culture war, a culture war that is sweeping our nation. Well, that was Lee Anderson at a press conference a short while ago. Uh, let's talk to the BBC's chief political correspondent, Henry Zeffman. How much of a blow is this to Rishi Sunak? It's undoubtedly a blow. At the very least, what this will do is reinvigorate a debate within the Conservative Party among Conservative MPs about the direction of the Conservative Party and about its electoral strategy, whether we're weeks out or months out from an election. And that's at a time where Rishi Sunak is trying to unite Conservative MPs behind what he says is his plan. We heard that last week in the context of the budget, but also what that really means is a political plan to try and reverse Labour's thumping great poll lead. Whether it will be a big electoral blow to the Conservative Party, well, we'll find out how much of an asset Lee Anderson turns out to be for reform, how different it is for that party, which has got to about 10% in the polls on average, but whether they're sort of turbocharged by having a parliamentary spokesman. I think people differ in conversations I've had with Conservative MPs today about how much of an asset Lee Anderson will be. But one person we know who at least previously thought that Lee Anderson had an appeal mm. to a particular slice of the electorate was Rishi Sunak, because it was him who made him deputy chairman of the Conservative Party a year ago. We'll now find out whether he was right about Lee Anderson's appeal. Yes, I mean, there is a judgment call here, isn't there? Yeah, I mean, there was a judgment call from Rishi Sunak a year back in making Lee Anderson a prominent figure in the Conservative Party. There was also a judgment call from Rishi Sunak in suspending Lee Anderson from the Conservative Party, or from the whip, a few weeks ago after he said that Sadiq Khan, the mayor of London, was controlled by Islamists. And it's worth noting in that particular point, you know, Lee Anderson has made this decision from a position of relative political weakness. It's not the same as if he'd made it at the start of the year when he was still a Conservative MP in good standing, as it were. Right. And in terms of a by-election, that's not going to happen, is it? 
No, it's not. Our colleague Chris Mason asked Lee Anderson at the press conference just a little while ago whether he would be resigning from Parliament and triggering a by-election in his Ashfield constituency under his new party banner. He said he wouldn't. He said both because a general election is around the corner and also because or Richard Tice, the leader of the Reform Party, said he didn't want to waste taxpayers' money. But it is worth noting that's a big difference from back in 2014 when UKIP, which shares many personnel and similarities with reform, they got two defections from the Conservative Party, first Douglas Carswell mm. and then Mark Reckless. Both of them had the political confidence or made the decision for whatever reason to resign from Parliament and force a by-election for UKIP. Both of them, as it happened, won. Lee Anderson isn't following suit. Henry Zethman, thank you very much. Um, Danny Kruger, do you feel let down, angry with Lee Anderson? Well, I feel very sorry. I regret the decision he's taken. I mean, he's a friend of mine and I sympathised with the situation he was in. I think it was the wrong thing to do to withdraw the whip from him the other day. Uh, a reprimand would have done. And, but more broadly, what this means, and it's Lee's decision to take, and I wouldn't have done it and I wish he wasn't doing it, but it reflects the fact that we as a party have lost the coalition of voters that backed us in 2019, that gave us that great majority and that great mandate. And I think today is a wake-up call for us as a party to, in short order, try and reassemble that coalition. When you say a wake-up call, what do you mean? What has to change? We need to be much more deliberate about a policy platform that will win back those voters who've left us. Remember, the Labour is doing very well in the polls mm. because the polls don't count the people who aren't voting for anybody, who are saying they don't like anybody. And most of those people did vote for us. So they're not, they haven't gone to Labour. We need to win them back. But we're not going to do it unless we take a very bold And if, if the decision. Prime Minister doesn't take the bold steps that you are proposing, mm. should he be challenged? Well, listen, let's see. I don't, I don't think we need to worry about the leadership. The, we're committed to Rishi's leadership. He has the, you know, the backing of Parliament at the moment. The main thing is a policy agenda. Nobody objects to Rishi personally. The issue is... Is he setting out the positions on immigration, on crime, on tax, on defence? Because you agree with everything that you here. agree with everything I, that so, Lee Anderson so said. So I represent a very different constituency. Mm. But what was so amazing about 2019 is that places like mine, in Wiltshire, and places like his in Nottinghamshire, they all voted for exactly the same manifesto. And it, we brought the country together momentarily. It was a brilliant moment of having a properly national party. Right. And that coalition has been fractured. And. I don't think Labour's able to reassemble it. Well, I'll come, we, I'll, we I'll, can I'll come on to the, if we get the policies you, you right. But you haven't answered the question. You agree with every single thing that we just heard Lee Anderson say. Yeah. So what's stopping you well, going over no, to reform? Well, no, I don't... Because well, <laughs> I don't agree with him about switching parties. Oh. I think the Conservative <laughs> Party is the answer. I'm not sure that reform is a proper party of government. They have a very coherent protest voice at the moment, but what they're calling for is for the Conservative Party to be Conservative. Right. I mean, Siobhan, in that press conference, uh, Lee Anderson warns about Starmageddon, is what he calls, uh, and says the Tory party is at risk of making that happen. But you haven't sealed the deal with the Red Wall, the former seats, uh, or the seats that used to vote Labour, have you? Well, we had a, a disastrous result in 2019, the worst since 1935. I think you'll find that most people in the Labour Party are far more cautious about what the result of the next election might be than journalists or po the polls indicate. We know what it is, what a huge leap. We would n if we get the same swing as we got in 1997, we'd have a majority of two. I mean, we know what we're talking about, and it's a huge mountain to climb. So, right, so how, big a threat no is well, how big a threat is Reform UK to the Labour Party, if they're polling at between 10 and 13 per cent, um, to the seats that you need to win back? I think, at the moment, I think there's a potential for them being a threat to both Labour and Conservatives, but at the moment, I think that they're a, 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 bigger, um, a bigger threat to the Conservatives. And as far as the little clip, I've only seen the little clip that you've just shown us mm. of his press conference. Mm. Who says it is wrong to talk about immigration, mm. illegal or legal? They're perfectly legitimate things to speak about. Ah. It's kind of what he does ah. in order to suggest that, you know, he sets these things up only to strike them down. Well, what is wrong with well, talking about it? I mean, I'm glad to hear Siobhan say that. And, of course, many decent Labour MPs are happy to have this conversation. The problem is, whenever we do raise concerns about legal or illegal migration, we are accused of racism, of dog-whistling, of wanting to have a, you know, a, a kind of white-only Britain. I mean, all of that comes at us from Labour and Labour supporters mm -hmm. so, and, and Liberal Democrats. So I'm afraid 
yes, we could have a general discussion about the policy agenda, but once, once you start proposing, as we do, that we need to take robust action to stop the boats or that we need to radically reduce the but, net migration but, uh, in this country, wait. we are accused of all sorts of political extremism. So, well, Sibyl? But, but you have to look at, at what has actually happened to, to make your judgment. And if you look at what happened... Um, under Labour when we were in power. You know, we sorted out the Home Office, got the backlogs down uh, and and did bring in a properly legitimate millions system. Millions and millions of people from Eastern Europe, which... <laughs> that's what the, the that's migration that problem was. What's, what's happened to the levels of immigration well, yeah, if I'm you're afraid. worried about so it? This I... Is where, so I think, that, I think the challenge that Lee is addressing is across the country in all our constituencies, there are people very, very disappointed with both the mainstream parties. And what happened in 2019 is that we promised to change the consensus, particularly around immigration and the borders. We haven't yet done that, and that is why we are suffering. And we can reassemble that coalition if we get our policy plan right. How big a blow do you think it is to, uh, to Rishi Sunak? I'll, actually, I'll go to Jeff first. Well, I think, you know, Lee Anderson is a bit of a political nomad in some ways. It wasn't that long ago Labour. that he was a Labour councillor. Mm. And then he was, you know, he's in the Tory party, but he wants to shoot from the hip. So in that sense, uh, it could well be that reform is, is, is a good fit, uh, fit for him. I agree with Siobhan that there were a few straw mans in there where he's saying mm. it shouldn't be controversial and then listed a bunch of things yeah. that actually aren't controversial now. They might have been actually at the back end of New Labour, I think, but they aren't controversial subjects now. I think, you know, in a way... Like, I think that Lee Anderson, I've disagreed with several things that he said, but his background, you know, as a minor, single dad, his story is incredible. And I think that it's, you know, I can understand why he's with the Reform Party, but we need more people with that kind of voice uh, in the House of Commons to begin with. I do think that he's box office to us. We love our politics. We love the drama. You know, he's, we want to know what he said next. I think he could definitely win in Ashfield again. As far as the, the wider public, they're sort of dimly aware of him, and I don't know if it will fundamentally change reforms uh, position in national polls. Grace? Yeah, I mean, I don't think he's uh, he's much of a, a threat um, to what is highly likely to be a massive landslide victory for the Labour Party, purely because the Conservative Party is exhausted, it's completely out of ideas, it's kind of ideologically defunct, it's hollowed out, and it... I've spoken to a couple of MPs who've just said, we need a bit of time out of office to decide where we go next. <laughs> now, Anderson mentioned there, I think, the interesting point, which is that do you decide to go full culture war and basically say our economy is failing, our public services are failing, let's distract people by fighting this culture war and, like, take attention away from the issues that people actually care about? Or do you say, we're actually going to come back with a kind of, you know, one nation Toryist attempt to really fix some of these problems, to fix housing, to fix public services? And that is basically, I think, the, the, the choice that the Conservative Party has when it will well, be out I, of office. I don't, Grace, I don't think it is a choice. I think it's all one agenda, and that's the agenda that won us the 2019 election victory. You could call it a culture war because it was about borders and migration and sovereignty and those questions and kind of anti-woke. But it was also about rebalancing the economy. It was about fixing the NHS. It was about making the government work it for the people. Very, oh, wait a second. It was a very wait a second. Wait a, wait a second. Well, I think that's what, those that, that, two is, things. that is what the public want, and that is what the Conservative Party is in a position ideologically to deliver, because but is we're on it? the right Are side you of the public on both of those questions. the economy after more than I a decade of austerity. But you don't ideologically reduce NHS waiting lists. You give people their operations <laughs> and they get into hospital or they have their... Well, you have to pay for that and you have to have an NHS but, that works. But, yeah, yeah. But, but you are in government. You have mm. been in government for 13 years and it's not unreasonable to ask... No, what the hell it's is going on? It's a very powerful line you've got there, Siobhan. It's probably the only one, because I don't see what <laughs> Labour have got to offer for the future. Well, we'll, come, up, we'll, come, up, we'll come on to uh, Labour in a moment. Do you think other of your colleagues will follow uh, Lee Anderson? Is I, there a sense that that will happen? I, I don't know. I, I doubt it. I mean, you know, obviously, a lot of my colleagues, me included, we're all worried about our seats because the polls look so bad. As I say, mm. it's because people are saying they're, they're not going to vote for anybody. I don't think so. I think Lee is one of a kind. Jeff says he was Labour, then Conservative, then Reform. I think he's quite a kind of self-willed character. I don't think many colleagues will follow him. The most important thing, though, is we mm. listen to him. We don't just attack him uh, and say he's, ma he's mad. He's actually making a very legitimate point about the people who voted for him last time and what they're looking for now. But he's but also saying he's not apologising for the comments that he made. But in a way, hasn't he sort of let down his own agenda? Because mm. part of Lee Anderson's whole philosophy is that people like me need to have a voice in mainstream yeah. politics. And he said some things that were objectively controversial and he didn't want to apologise. And now he finds himself in what could be, you know, potentially... I mean, it might do well, they might do well reform, but we should also remember that big political figures like Nigel Farage haven't won 
one uh, at general elections. No. And, uh, you know, if, if he stands elsewhere other than Ashfield, that could also be the case for Lee. So in terms of, I think it's a good move for him. Whether it's a good move for the things that he professes to care about, I'm not so sure. I agree. Let's talk about this story in BBC News headline. Princess of Wales, Kate Photo withdrawn by four news agencies amid manipulation concerns. Yes, let's show you uh, the photo. The image was taken by Prince William for Mother's Day. It was the first of Catherine to be released by Kensington Palace since her surgery in January. But then, as we said, four uh, news agencies have pulled it uh, because they said there had been some manipulation in some of the detail in the photos when they uh, looked more closely. Now, in response to the furore, we've had this tweet from the Prince and Princess of Wales. Like many amateur photographers, she says, I do occasionally experiment with editing. I wanted to express my apologies for any confusion the family photograph we shared yesterday caused. I hope everyone celebrating had a very happy Mother's Day. See Catherine there. Uh, let's talk to Charlotte Gallagher, royal correspondent with the BBC. How embarrassing is this for the royal family? I think at best it's embarrassing for the royal family. This photo has sparked thousands of jokes, thousands of memes about dodgy photoshopping, particular focus on Princess Charlotte and her wrist and the cuff of the cardigan. It looks very odd. At worst, this is a question about trust and do the public trust what the royal family tell them and show them. And if people don't trust that, that is a very serious issue for the royal family. This photo was released as a way of reassuring people about the health of the Princess of Wales, but it's done the opposite. I mean, it's dominating front pages. It's fed into these wild conspiracy theories about the health of the princess. And now we've got really this unprecedented statement from her saying that she edited this photo herself. This has been completely disastrous for the royal family in terms of public relations. One thing I suppose they could do to clear this up would be to release the unedited original photo. Kensington Palace have said they are not going to do that, though. No, I suppose maybe that's not a, a surprise. Charlotte Gallagher, thank you very much uh, for joining us with that. What do you make of this? I mean, the issue of trust raised uh, by Charlotte is an important one. Yeah, first up, look, I'm a comedian on this panel. I could just say it was really interesting. Last night, I should have been thinking about my documentary, but I was refreshing, refreshing, refreshing. Well, then we saw there was this word, kill notification. Yes, <laughs> about the it's very it sounded, dramatic, well, isn't it? It sounded like a 90s action film with Steven Seagal. I was, um, I, I, and then, like, in a normal world, a, a mum touching up a photo for social media is not a controversial thing. It happens all the time. But what it's done is, on the back of wanton speculation, it seems to have validated wow. that. And, and, you know, with the royal family as it's been, you know, since Queen Elizabeth sadly passed, uh, it, you know, the share price, if you had shares in it, you would sell. Right. I mean, disastrous, would you agree? With Look, I think the, the very fact of all of these conspiracy theories coming out, it just sheds light on the fact that we have this arcane institution that is basically a feudal institution that sits at the heart of our democracy and people don't have, you know, the ability to hold the royal family to account. They can't see what goes on inside. I'm a Republican. I've been a Republican for a very long time. That used to be a very niche position. And as these scandals build and as people start to think scandal? who are these people... Is this a scandal? I think it is. Yeah, I don't but think that's it's, controversial to say. Okay. It's interesting, though, Grace. I mean, it, it, it's objectively, in a difficult time, every once in a while, and I know this is not their official function, but sometimes the royal family just give us something really odd to focus on, other than all, all the It is very shit. good distraction from mm. the, you know, abject poverty and inequality and all the horrible things that we have in our economy, sure, but I think that's very convenient. It, to it's an amazing power. dead cat, isn't it? Well, do, do you think that that's what it's been... Do you think that's what it is, the dead cat? No, I'd, have to be, I'd have to be a conspiracy <laughs> theorist you would. myself to believe Sorry, that. Sorry, I missed the irony there in your voice. Yeah, uh, Danny? Yeah. I have absolutely nothing to say other than how good it is to see her looking so well. Um, I mean, <laughs> listen, I mean, politicians can't talk about the royal family. Um, other than well. to say, the fact that we're so interested... It re 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 relates to the fact that the royal family are hugely popular for a very good reason. They're decent people and they do a great job and the public love them. Right. Except well, for a tiny minority. Well, well it used to be a best. tiny minority, not so Still much anymore. Tiny. I, which I is just think the poor woman has been through what seems like a very mm. big operation and is trying to get better. Just yeah. leave her alone. Let's move on um, and talk about the economy. Uh, BBC News, Rachel Reeves, the Shadow Chancellor. Labour won't be able to turn things around immediately. Uh, she was interviewed yesterday on BBC Sunday with Laura Koonsberg and she was being asked repeatedly about what her priorities would be and how she would get the economy growing. Let's have a look. 
I want taxes on working people to be lower, but you've always got to explain where the money comes from uh, for that. But look, the thing that got me into politics in the first place was education and schools. I, I went to school in the 80s and 90s, the last time that we had a long period of Conservative government. And when I was in the sixth form, our, our sixth form was two prefab huts in a playground. Mm -hmm. Our school library was turned into a classroom because there were more students than there was space. So services are your instincts rather well, than more education. Tax you know, when Tony Blair said education, 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 that's what got me involved in politics. Siobhan, should spending on public services be the priority of a Labour government? It's always going to be the priority of a Labour government, isn't it? That's what we came into being to do, but to provide no a better society. there's no promise to put more money in. In fact, with unprotected departments, as we found out from the budget last week, as a result of the figures, they're going to have to be cut. If you win the election this year, they're cuts you're going to have to make. I don't think it's any secret that without growing the economy, we're not going to have more money to do the things we want to do. Nobody could look at our hospitals and think they're great. Nobody could do an advice surgery as an MP and see the number of kids waiting 18 months for an appointment with mental health services and think that's OK. Most of us came into politics to deal with yeah. those issues. So why not oppose the tax cuts uh, to national insurance and instead say that a future Labour government would commit that money several billion pounds to the National Health Service. Because Rachel Reeves is absolutely right. We're being taxed more highly now than we were in the 1950s. Yeah. Um, also, I mean, you have to grow the economy. You have to build the houses, do the science and research that are the areas that will actually bring us more money and give us money to do the things we'd really love to do. Right. The, real, well, the real problem, I think, is that we have absolutely no indication as to how the Labour Party is allegedly mm. going to grow the economy. You know, even the Chinese Communist Party, which has unprecedented control over the entire economy, is not able to magic growth out of thin air when the global economy is in a, a, a bit of a difficult situation. We have the £28 billion pledge to invest in decarbonisation. That's well, gone. Well, we don't, oh, yeah, I was going to say. It's gone, yeah. basically, you know. Um, and so it's kind of like, where is this magical growth going to come mm. from unless you can kind of just wave a magic wand and expect the, the global economy to come out of a... Of well, a let's well, see what Siobhan says. Well, what I'm excited about is to hear Keir Starmer talk about building houses, reforming the planning system. Mm -hmm. I mean, for a long time, it's a bit of a niche policy, but I've been campaigning on building on the ungreen green belt uh, with a professor from the uh, London School of Economics and he reckons there are a million homes you could build close to outer London train stations and the prospect of getting a home for the children that I see mm. who've never had a permanent well, home you... and the prospect of people being able to get on the ladder and buy their sure. home but, but Grace, do you believe me? they'll be able to do that that Labour in well, government will be able to bulldoze through opposition which will be fierce to an awful lot of the planning applications on the basis of what we've currently heard from the Labour Party no and not just because of the planning system because building housing if you do it properly requires investment the problem that they were going to see and we saw from Keir Starmer the other day is that this plan to build lots of houses relies on private developers who mm. we know drip feed housing into the market to maintain their profits. The time that the, that the Labour Party stood up for the NHS, stood up for working people and built lots of housing was immediately after the Second World War when you had, yes, a big increase in borrowing to transform the country that ultimately led to longer growth over the long term because it was investment in people, it was investment in the economy led by a proud well, socialist contingent well, uh, of MPs. Actually, um, uh, I think that the Labour's view about an, uh, having a wealth fund to do most to do these projects, to, un to unleash money in the private sector only in my own small way. I've just recently written to the top 10 pension funds in the country in an effort to try and get some money in my local area, in Mitcham, where Jeff will know, to build temporary accommodation. But you don't because need to do this. Well, it's always me, cheaper for the public sector to borrow than to try and well, convince let me bring, private investors to do it for you. Let me bring the others in. Do you think Labour will make a difference in the way Rachel Reeves has said? Um, I mean, obviously, critics of the Conservative Party would say you couldn't fail to do any worse uh, than the government that's in power at the moment. But can they make a real difference? Well, Labour aren't short of noble intentions. I mean, somebody like me who's sort of on the centre right, but even I was looking at that 28 billion green policy going, right, they're talking about having the highest sustainable growth in the G7. There's, got, there's only really two ways that you can really stimulate an economy. You're either going to cut taxes or you're going to borrow to invest. They're not saying that they're going to do either of those things. I mean, Rachel Reeves is quite a reassuring figure in a way. She's got ah. an establishment figure. She's got history mm. in banking. You know, she seems mm. not that different from what we've currently got. I know that Labour, and, and quite rightly, there are economic problems they're going 
going to inherit, they want to dampen down expectations. But you've got to do a bit of the hope thing as well. And you've got to be really clear about where that's going to come from. Right. On hope. Do they I, need to have more hope? Do you yes, need to have more yeah, hope? Yeah, I mean, I did a lot of work in the Kingswood by-election just outside Bristol. Mm. And talking to voters, I just came away with the fact there needs to be some plausible, real optimism and positivity. But, but you also have to make sure that you're not going to let d people down and promise things more quickly than you can actually deliver them. So it's about finding that well, balance. Yes, and that's a bit like the Conservative Party. We are the party of low taxation. Mm. You can't credibly say that mm. anymore, uh, Danny. Uh, taxes have gone up and up, yep. maybe rightly, but they've gone up and up, and now they are at record highs. They certainly are, as is borrowing and spending. So the idea that we can tax and spend our way out of the problems we've got, I don't think is right. We do need to bring taxation down. Mm. We do need to invest and we need to reform. But I would say... Well, the Labour more, Party more says they're doing all of that. It, well, I don't, we haven't heard the details. Mm. So the challenge we've got, and I go back to what I was saying earlier, both our parties, I'm afraid, are, seem to be invested in a, in a consensus around a large state and a corporatist public sector and an unreformed private sector. Ah. We need, every, if I may, if I, we need everything I think that Grace was talking about, which is a new economy that actually recognises the importance of getting capital into ordinary people's pockets that supports growth from the bottom up. I don't think it's about being a bigger, ever bigger government or more borrowing, but it is about breaking down the cartels, particularly house builders, which have captured the economy and have disenfranchised ordinary people. And again, going back to 2019, that's what we promised. That's what actually the Conservative philosophy really is. It's not about being in the pockets of developers and a small cartel mm. of big businesses. But and it's a tragedy. An it's a tragedy, I'm afraid to say, and I'm not going to excuse us, it's a tragedy that people think that my party is a party of big business. We absolutely are not. That is <laughs> not what we're about. No, I mean, Labour is closer, actually, to this oh. corporatist model than the... Than the the genuine conservative philosophy. I think our challenge is to remind but, people whose side we're really on, which is ordinary people and small businesses. Well, uh, on that, whose side are you really on? You are admitting that there's very, very little to pick between both Labour and the Conservatives. Well, I think there is. A... I'm not admitting it. No, I, I meant you. <laughs> no, we're, we're, no. We're, when we're, I said you, I mean <laughs> you. This is not true. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is the almost impossible challenge we have to get across to the, to the public. We've been in power for all of these years, and yet, as Rishi tried to set out at our party conference last October, we actually represent change and Labour represent more of the same. Oh. It's a difficult one because they're the, they're the challenges. <laughs> yes. The reality is, and you hear it from Rachel Reeves, they're not going to do anything. Right. But really so there is no and, and we came in with a mandate to change and because of Covid, because of Ukraine, because of all our own self-imposed ridiculous political changes, yeah. we haven't yet delivered... But you're still party. happy in the Conservative but, but party. Absolutely, because our philosophy <laughs> absolutely. is the right one. There. They're not the party of big business, they're the party of change. It's, it's a lot to take on. I mean, Danny... <laughs> sorry, sorry, I know it's confusing, but <laughs> I, 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 I'm think confused. about it. I mean, what, one of the things you said there, mm -hmm. uh, to Siobhan, and it is a legitimate c uh, criticism, is what are Labour's plans? But you have yeah. to be honest with it, that you pickpocketed the non-dollar yeah. thing. So, yeah. d d well, I mean, pickpocketing policy, <laughs> that should be seen as a success. You, Surely you're... they got their policy achieved. That's all that really matters. But now, but that Labour also... Labour now nicked our, our, our national insurance policy. Hang on, hang on. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, Sorry. That indirectly gives Labour a legitimate reason to say, well, we're not going to tell you what we're going to do, because last time we yeah. did it, you did it. That's right. I think people are so sick of hearing politicians say, we are the party of change, only for them to come into office and then get dragged ah. immediately into the centre by the vested interests that do have a massive influence, well not just over the political parties, but over our democracy as a whole. The only now, thing is, look, Grace, but the only thing Grace is politic, the well, politically, what happened in 2019 when there was a radical uh, prospectus put forward by Jeremy Corbyn? It was Labour's worst ever election defeat. Look, I mean, that particular set of policies was obviously very popular and the coalition behind that was carved up by this combination, this very successful combination of culture war and saying we're going to fix the so economy. you think the policies I were right, the economic policies, policies even though no one It's the only time that we've had radical change in this country has not actually come from politicians turning around and deciding <laughs> we're going to do things differently. It's come from working people organising in the streets, in their communities and saying we demand so a true. different kind of economy. Grace, it was the so Labour rubbish. movement. Well, it's not. Yeah, let's, it was let's, the let's Labour movement that, that, that founded the Labour Party and that supported politicians What's like Nye Bell and on the far right of the far left, sorry, of the party at the time, <laughs> yeah. far left of the party at the time, to create the NHS in the midst of massive um, opposition within the state mm. from uh, from the doctors, yes. from every part of and society. And there was a phrase, I think, at the time, um, having just seen the play, that in the end he had to stuff their mouths with gold in yeah. order for it to happen. We need um, people But you power, say she's completely wrong. Oh, she's absolutely completely wrong. Life expectancy increased under the last Labour government. Uh, people's incomes uh, improved. Our schools were transformed. Our NHS waiting lists were down. There were lots and lots. You can 
can always do more. I think it was Wilson who said that Labour is nothing if not a crusade, you know, that there's always more to do. Of course there is. But the idea that you can't improve things, which I think is actually the Conservative argument, you can't do everything and it, they're all as bad as one is another. That, are you going to do anything different? Well. Are you, you're not going to do anything different. But of course we're going to do something different. What? We're going to concentrate on building houses, okay. developing, science, deve developing our science in order to bring about no growth investment. in our economy so we can actually do the things that we came into politics to do. You've written a book, Vulture Capitalism. It's obviously addressing some of the things that, <laughs> we, just, on all of this, uh, that yeah. we have <laughs> that we have been talking about. What are you actually proposing now, then, as a prospectus to change change the country, change the economy and reduce inequality? Sure. So, look, I think our politics for a very long time now has been stuck in this basically sterile divide between people who say more market and people who say more state. And what we don't actually recognise is the fact that most of the people in positions of power, whether that's in the public or private sector, basically work together to achieve the same ends, whether that's, you know, the government bailing out the banks or whether it's, you know, big corporations lobbying mm. the major political parties. So what what we happen? need mm. is real democracy, Which right? Is. And that has to be built from the grassroots up. So, you know, we've got some amazing... I, I look in the book at some fantastic examples of things like community wealth building, where local communities are working with uh, their kind of local governments to say, we're going to develop cooperatives, we're going to develop community banking. We're going to actually challenge the concentrations of power, the gross concentrations of power in our society from the bottom up, and that's ah, what I want to see more yeah, of. Yeah, and I so, want to see Labour supporting that. Well, you, you should, because that is actually their tradition, as you mm. say. New Labour was a terrible break with the old Labour tradition of mutual self-help, bottom-up, organic... But they uh, won three elections. Winning, well, yes. Well, so that was the problem but, for you, Well, yes, and, 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 and yet, actually, so much of our problems we've got now are the inheritance of the Blair years. But not the last 13 well, years. Well, no, we, because right, I'm afraid but, to say we followed too much of that, that, that model. But, but on this, right, on this, this localism agenda, I completely support local wealth building, community land trusts, a more organic, kind of civil society led, properly communitarian kind of politics. Grace, you're more of a conservative than you admit. Ah, we, we there's stand, an invitation for bombshell. you. We stand equally against big state and big business, and we're on the side of local communities, and that is what conservatism is about. But is that the reality of the Conservative mm. Party and Conservative government? You're obviously surprised by everything Dan is saying, because you don't recognise him as a Conservative. No, no, I suppose, no, if you look back, we were talking about this before, you know, the mid-70s, before they went full free market, there was a lot more of what Danny's talking about, uh, what was present. But, but has you, Grace got a point? I, th I think that, you know, since Covid has been a real game-changer, that people mm. generally do want more big state intervention, and we've seen well, certain I mean, um, wealth disparities, uh, disparities occurring. Mm. I think that you know, Aaron Bastani, who appears in my doc, which we'll discuss in a minute, yes. but he's a left-wing commentator, and one of the things he said I think is really interesting is that a lot of the British public are closer to Farage on immigration and Corbyn on economics, and that creates a really interesting space, which currently the, both, the two main parties are falling between, and it could be interesting for Labour. There might be a lot of people that are voting for them with the hope of real change, but if Labour don't deliver some sort of meaningful change, you could see left-wing alternatives as well as something like reform. Well, picking up on that, this headline, uh, Siobhan, in the eye, Labour rules out taxing wealthy to avoid £20 billion worth of cuts, which would be to some uh, departments. You're ahead in the polls by a long way. Why not promise something a bit more radical? Do you remember the 1992 general election? I do. Yeah, I spent my time going out on the streets of Mitcham with a ready reckoner saying, don't worry, we're going to include, increase child benefit, we're going to increase pensions, and you won't pay any more tax because you don't earn £25,000 a year. It's precisely because once you did that, you couldn't control the argument. And the idea that the polls say X or Y and it's what's going to happen is for the birds. Fair enough. Let's I mean, talk... Oh, it, all right, just some... A, but it's a super wealth tax. A lot of people just say tax is super wealthy as though it's some sort of silver bullet. It's well... Not, it's not a zero-sum game. I mean, it's, it appeals to me. The idea I of mean, these, these billionaires having less money is not a problem for me the, at all. But, but there, there are consequences The to economy it. that we live in today is the legacy of conservative Thatcherism and then it's kind of, you know, uh, concretization by Blair. And you saw inequality uh, increase sharply over the 1980s and then it's kind of stayed a bit you know, a bit similar since then, and then over austerity, it seems to have increased some more. And people are really concerned about that. So it does beg the question, there is this open goal, you tax wealth, you tax big corporations, and you use that to pay for an increase in public services, which are basically, you know, on the verge of, uh, of collapsing which across the economy. Which obviously was what we were trying to do with a non-DOM status, 
and with the... It wasn't with, going to raise that much money. It wasn't with, going to be transformative. And with the, well, it was enough for them... For well, the that's true. They said it was a terrible idea and now they've done and it. And it yeah. was enough for them to extend the windfall tax uh, sure, uh, in the North sure. Sea in order to get some money to do some stuff. All right. Well, whatever stuff uh, that <laughs> may be, we're going to talk about higher education and universities because, Jeff, you've made a documentary for BBC Two and iPlayer which asked the question, is university really worth it? Let's just take a look at this clip. It has got me reflecting about when I used to be a teacher and I was part of a machine that was selling this idea to kids that they all needed to go to university. On that note, today you guys have uh, got me a meeting with some of my former students and I had good relationships with those kids, so some of them may have done a degree on the basis of what I said. Now, I don't know whether that worked out for them or whether that ruined their life. Jocelyn, did you end up going to university? I did, yeah. Um, so I study journalism. Um, so I wanted to be a journalist, but mm -hmm. I ended up going uh, doing events management as my job instead. And Aaron, what about you? Left school and then went straight into the army. Jake didn't go to university either, but his girlfriend did, got a degree, and she's now a teacher. I've now got my own business, I run a barber shop. Sometimes I'll be looking at my takings at the shop for the week, and uh, she'll say, that's more than I earn in a month. Jeff, you went to university. Yes. And was it worth it? it was, I was the first in my family to go. You know, my mum from Mitcham came and she cried her eyes out when I had that scroll. I mean, it's a beautiful thing, right? Going to university, graduation, the scroll, all of the, the imagery around it is very powerful. But I suppose what I got to the point of thinking, like I was part of the Blair education, as many educations mm. as you well, can Well, they wanted to have half of young people tattooed attending. on your arm. I was yep. part of all of that. And yet when I started, I was going to start a fund for my son this year. Uh, and I suddenly thought, with all the noise coming out of the higher education sector in terms of grade inflation you know we've now got 40 percent of people with degrees it used to be four percent in the 60s uh, there's questions about its worth i know look i've got younger relatives that are earning 55 grand a year as scaffolders it, it was just mm. a cause for a reflection mm. it's not necessarily dismissing the idea and this film i suppose is, is a sort of whistle stop stock take of where higher education is at would you yeah sorry. i was just gonna say i think we're at a really interesting point when it comes mm. to higher education in particular because it was this like flagship policy of blairism and what blairism did is it really really said to people, it was, it was on the back of the kind of decimation of our communities, basically, the decimation of the labour movement, and this move towards individualism. So the idea was, you get an education, you pay for it, and you're responsible for everything that happens to you over the course of your life after that. And it fed into this sense of, there are winners who are at the top, and there are losers who are at the bottom. But do you not and think it, so it, wasn't a worthwhile, out, it wasn't a worthwhile aspiration? Of course, it's always worthwhile supporting people to get into university. What the, the shift was though? about was about the commercialisation and privatisation and individualisation of this process well, this, that made yeah. people people feel as though if you don't go to university, well, you're not a winner because you can't compete in this competitive think, economy that we've set up. I think Grace makes an interesting yeah. point there. The businessification of yes. it, that is a word, yeah. that does lead to certain yeah. things. If you're paying for a degree, you expect certain things. Yeah. This phenomenon I found out about grade inflation, where between 2010 and 2020, the amount of people getting first doubled. Now, it may well be. I'd love to believe that our bright students got the other thing it does, as bright, yeah. but I'm not sure. The other, the other thing it does is dislocates communities, because the idea is you go away to university, often in some big city, and you don't come back. Oh. And and you, and then you go on to often a pretty precarious job. You've got lots of debt. You drive up house prices in the towns where you're offered promised a career that doesn't materialise. And the communities that you come from suffer. And I think there's we have to have absolute choice. People should be allowed to move around. It's a wonderful thing in our country. There is so much geographic mobility. But we really need people to feel that their hometown, where often they identify most with, is somewhere they might want to come back to, or not even go away to university at all, study for skills, develop oh. a really successful career, and actually do just as well financially and for their oh, families well, well, the as if they'd never gone to university. Well, uh, the that's a lot of the well, documentaries I mean, about the financial. I just want, yes, yeah, Siobhan, but, looking but, at me slightly, yeah, yeah, let's get to everything Danny said. Yeah, because when people talk about cutting university places, they don't talk about stopping the kids of people who are earning a lot of money. They talk about stopping working class kids from actually having the opportunity oh. and going. So why not make Cause, it free? Because university is not for everybody, but for people who it was want it, you, should, right? should, yeah. it should, I had to it pay. should be that. <laughs> because well, if 40% yeah. of people yeah, are getting a, a degree, then it's much more difficult to fund that. I think the idea mm. that we're now charging people £9,000 a year well, and we're adding interest mm. is absolutely wrong and it's undermined our whole university sector because oh. we're now left with a sector uh, where completely dependent on international students, yeah. some of our most prestigious mm. London so universities. What would you do? So what would you do? Are you saying you would like to see tuition fees abolished or at least reduced? I don't or... want to see uh, tuition fees abolished. I, I 
voted to have them increased to 3,000. What I am sorry about is that they've increased to the extent that they have. And at the same time, it wasn't just that the uh, fees increased, but they removed um, the support and funding from the uh, government for the, universities. The, the so now they're completely dependent on them. Importantly, I'm look, I've come at this very much from the point of view of young people today and what yeah. it means for them and the debt. And the, the value of the loans available didn't go up in line with the cost of living crisis. So mm. it got even harder. And Grace makes a point about the fact she had to pay for her degree. The only defensiveness I've come up against with this is a lot of people in my generation going, I had a lovely time, mm. I was brilliant, I went and lived. And, and it's not an attack on their experience or the fact that they might have recommended it to their kids. It's just acknowledging that it's a fundamentally different choice for kids yeah. today and to try and be and to just we owe them being honest about that. And should that choice be made by teachers, uh, schools, parents in the way that you address well, it, does, I mean, it shouldn't well, be it shouldn't be yeah. this just straight path to Yeah, it should be an orthodoxy. You're yeah. absolutely right. And a couple of people did come back to me and say, well, you know, it's not really your choice. And I was thinking, God, it does come across as a bit sort of patrician that I'm saying to my son, right, you, you're coming up eight years old, I've got a plan for you. It's not, look, obviously he will make his own choices, but I'm quite, you know, I'm quite organised about saving plans and it just got to a point where I thought, this prospect, within one generation, what was a magical thing for me is a completely different proposition for my son. I think if we do move away from this model, then we have to look at the kind of ideology that underpinned it, right? And we have this idea that you go to university, you achieve a successful career and you make loads of money, and that's what the good and the great and the clever people will do. And everyone else doesn't really need support because if they fail, well, that's their own fault. That's why we need to rebuild our communities, we need public services, we need an investment in actually the fabric of our society. But if we're going to protect people but Grace, who don't about go the... on to have huge success and amazing No, degrees. but I mean, the point, actually, one of the points from the documentary is some people who don't go to university end up learning a trade, earning more money. Yeah. If it's about mm. financial well, incentives, isn't that a worthwhile but, pursuit? But, I mean, we want I, I people to go that... to university oh. to become teachers, to become <laughs> social workers, yeah, no, to become nurses, to we... become doctors. Absolutely. Well, you've got so to go... going to university to is as to... much no, about but then public I service. Say, say, and don't talk every time. I, <laughs> I should say that we obviously acknowledge that in the film that for certain careers and professions it makes a really obvious and logical choice. But that does skew towards certain jobs. It skews towards certain mm. um, universities. I mean, a really startling fact I found was that a male studying creative arts would have done better off finding financially if he'd gone to school straight from work. Overall, people still earn more from going to university, but there are massive variations within that. I mean, people are really struggling, some of the students, as you say, because the support, or you and Siobhan were saying, the support isn't there in terms of well, living yeah. costs, in terms of accommodation. I mean, you know, if we're looking at, at the pipeline that's affecting the way our public services are performing, why are we not supporting people who are going to become the doctors, the nurses, the mm. teachers, mm. reducing Just... their loans, like supporting them into university? Because these people... They are the, the, the foundations of everything. They care yeah, for us well, when we're old. They sure. educate our children. Why are we not you know, supporting these people? Why are the Labour Party not ah. saying we're going to invest in these people? Should, the Labour, should a Labour government reduce tuition fees? Well, politics is the language of priorities. It depends how far up that list you're actually going to get to within your five-year term, isn't it? I mean... But in principle... Would that be an ambition for you to see a Labour government cut the fees from 9,250? Well, if we cut the, the waiting lists in hospitals, if schools were OK, mm. if people had opportunities, they could get an appointment, then I would certainly not be something I'd be against. But it's a question about doing all those other things. You can never, ever um, stop the number of really good things it would be uh, to do. We were talking earlier about growth. I think a priority for growth should be to support more young people into well-paid jobs earlier on and to support their families and to help grow the Just local economy. So, so I would like to see more investment uh. in skills uh, and in All apprenticeships right. as well as a well-funded university well, education. I'm, I'm only coming in here because um, uh, we've heard from the Home Secretary, James Cleverley. Let's just listen to what he had to say about Lee Anderson defecting to Reform UK. Lee is someone who I've, uh, I've worked with um, I, I like him personally. I think he's made a real mistake. I think he's made a real mistake uh, because, as he has said in his own words, a reform is not the answer and a vote for reform will only let in a Labour government. No sound of any of the changes you would like to see uh, in response. Well, I mean, James is right, obviously. A vote for reform will probably make a Labour government more likely, so it was a bad move by Lee's part, but we need to listen to what he's saying. All right, that's all we've got time for. Thank you to all of my guests for today's programme. And tomorrow I'll be joined on the panel by the former Conservative Chancellor, Kwasi Kwarteng. Tune in, join me at 12.15 tomorrow. Bye-bye.